Hello, and welcome to our lecture on public opinion. Um, I want to talk about this. This uh, it's a very broad concept. I want to talk to you talk to you about it in some detail here. Obviously, our in a democratic republic which we live in, public opinion is is in theory the most important aspect of government since it is the public who chooses chooses our leaders and. Also, the, our leaders govern, govern on our behalf. Now, does public opinion affect governments? The answer is yes, and I've given you some obvious examples here. First is Marie Antoinette. You may recognize her, Queen of France, wife of Louis XVI. Her and her husband were overthrown during the French Revolution in 1789. Later, they had their heads chopped off in 1793. Um, supposedly, she said of the peasants, let them eat cake. She probably didn't actually say that. That was most likely pro-revolutionary propaganda. But her and her husband were both unpopular with the people, and ultimately it ended up costing them their heads. Um, more recently, and in the United States, is the case of Lyndon Johnson. Johnson had taken over as president when Kennedy was assassinated in November of 1963, he ran for a full term of his own in 64 and won decisively over Barry Goldwater. And since he had served less than two years of Kennedy's term, he was eligible to serve a second full term of his own. And he was planning to do just that. And he was running for president in 68, running for re-election in 68. But, as you probably know, the Vietnam War was going on in 68 and... The war was unpopular among the Democrats who were who were Johnson's base. And in March of 68, Eugene McCarthy, a surprise entry into the Democratic um, primary, managed to win 42% of the vote in New Hampshire, in the New Hampshire primary. Now, Johnson still won. He won with 49% of the vote, but still he was under 50%. And McCarthy did much better than expected, and this ended up showing that Johnson actually's re-election or um, renomination hopes were in danger, and McCarthy's strong showing and Johnson's weak showing convinced Robert F. Kennedy to go ahead and declare his candidacy for the presidency, which he did. Polls show Johnson trailing badly in Wisconsin to to Kennedy, and so on March thirty first, nineteen sixty eight. Johnson shocks the nation. He goes on TV and announces he is withdrawing from the re-election campaign. Probably good chance he would have lost the Democratic nomination had he continued. And even if he'd managed to win it, he would have been politically damaged and would have had a difficult time in the general election. Of course, the guy who ends up winning the general election 68 was Richard Nixon. He wins a close race over Hubert Humphrey. Um, rolls into 1972, very popular. He's opened up China, he's drawn down in Vietnam, and he ends up winning the general election in 1972 by carrying 49 states, which is one of the biggest landslides in American history. Of course, you, so he was riding high at that point. Of course, unfortunately, he used some dishonest tactics during his re-election campaign, most notably the Watergate break-in. We don't know if Nixon ordered it ahead of time or knew about it ahead of time, but we do know that when he found out about it, he lied about it and tried to cover it up. And of course, this ends up blowing up in his face when it comes out that um, Nixon had lied about crimes committed by people working for his campaign. It sinks his approval rating in 1974, August of 74. He's facing impeachment. He goes ahead and resigns the presidency. His approval rating at that point is 25%, so public opinion turned against him pretty fast. Another example would be Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Clinton's elected in 92. The economy is pretty bad at that point, and it stays pretty sluggish for the first couple years of his term. Um, going into the midterm elections in 94, he was unpopular. His approval rating was only about 37%, and... As one result of this, the Republicans managed to take control of both the House and the Senate in the midterms in 94. First time they controlled both the House and the Senate in 40 years. And the smart money at that point was on Bill Clinton's toast. He's not going to be able to win re-election in 96. His popularity is too low. The voters have made it clear they don't support him in the midterms. 
But as you probably know, the economy starts improving after 94, 95, 96, and by 96, it's pretty good. Also, Clinton works with the Republicans in Congress, and one result of this is approval rating starts to improve, and by 96, his approval rating's back up in the 50s, which is good shape to be in going into re-election, and he ends up winning re-election over Bob Dole. So these are all examples of how public opinion has impacted government. Now, let's look at some approval ratings for the current president and previous presidents. Here's the Real Clear Politics presidential poll average for President Trump. Um, what, how this works is they take several polls, all the uh, major um, legitimate respected polls, and average them together, and that's where they get these numbers. So as of yesterday, March 6, 2008, 2019, still in 2018, 2019, Trump's disapproval rating is about 40, or is it 53%, and his approval rating is at 44%. And you can see it's tracked over time. There's not, I don't have a date on here, but it started the day on January 27th, 2017. So right after he took office and goes forward to today. And you can see it's varied some. The red is disapproved and the black is approve. He's actually a little more popular than he was a while back, but there's his there's his numbers. Um, here's the average for President Obama beginning when he took office in January of 2009 and ending when he left office in January of 2017. You can see he started out approval ratings up in, around, up in the 60s, but as time went on, it, they tightened up, and when he left office, his approval rating was about 46%, and his disapproval rating was 49%. Stayed roughly consistent, though, um, other, than, other than what's sometimes called the honeymoon phase. Usually when a president takes office, first takes office, their numbers are high, but then they tighten up as, you know, they have to make tough decisions and controversy and things like that. Um... Obama's predecessor was George W. Bush, and here's the here's his uh, approval rating tracked for his entire presidency. Like Obama, he started out close to 60%, called the honeymoon phase. Then, a few months after he's elected, after her, about eight months after he becomes president, the attacks of September 11th, 2001 happen, and he's pretty popular, or very popular, I should say, at that point. His approval rating goes almost to 90%. In fact, I think Gallup had him at 90%, and that's the record for highest approval rating of a president ever recorded. Um, his first term, which ends here, he stays pretty popular. He's not going to stay at 90% forever. But he's still over 50%, which is usually where you want to be going into re-election. Second term, though, things start going going badly. Um, the our war in Iraq ends up dragging on longer than longer than most Americans anticipated. Um, Hurricane Katrina hits New Orleans. That hurts him. And then the economy tanks over here in 2007, 2008. And so when he leaves office, he's at about 30%. So what is public opinion? We need to talk about this. Basically, public opinion is the aggregate of individual attitudes or beliefs about certain issues or officials. There's your textbook clinical definition of it. What does aggregate mean? Average. Um, certain issues or officials. So the president's approval rating um, can be, is an example of public opinion, Americans' opinions on, say, taxes or gun control or abortion or trade. Um, if you measure these through different means, usually polls, although you can also do it through elections, um, that would be an example of public opinion. It's, it's expressed, public opinion is, through voting, through polls, through contact with um, public officials. The most reliable indicator of what the public is thinking are polls, which we will talk about. And I know polls are, can be a little controversial, but we're going to talk about them in detail, explain how they work, all those things. All right, but before we get to that, we need to talk about the government and why public opinion is important. We are a democratic republic, and as such, the health and stability of our system rests with the public. The government is legitimate only because Americans view it as legitimate. There's nothing magic in a democracy. Um, it's not like a monarchy where... The government rules by divine right, or a dictatorship where dictator rules because he will kill you if you 
oppose him. Um, the only thing that makes our government legitimate is the fact that we accept it as legitimate. And if we ever get to the point where a good good chunk of Americans, high percentage, not even a majority, but a significant percentage of Americans view the government as illegitimate, then things will start going badly, probably. Because once you decide the government is no longer legitimate, it becomes acceptable to operate outside the law to change it. So the rule of law breaks down once people start seeing the government and the laws themselves as illegitimate. Now, most Americans still view the federal government and state governments as legitimate, but public opinion has definitely soured on the government. Um, this is through things like efficacy. This is the extent to which people believe their actions affect the course of government. And this has declined considerably. In the 1960s, about 70% of Americans believed their actions had an impact on the course of government. Today, the numbers are more like between 30 and 40%. Political trust, this is the extent to which people believe the government acts in their best interest. You think the government acts in your best interest? Um, the answer is most Americans say no. A poll in 2010, for example, found only about 19% of Americans believe the government acts in their best interest. If you taken a poll like that in 1960, the number would have probably been more like 60 or 70%. <coughs> so... Definitely, we've become more cynical about the government. Why is that? Well, one reason is we know a lot more about it. Um, you got to think before 1960, this was before the Vietnam War, or before we got involved in the Vietnam War, I should say. Also before Watergate. And those two things demonstrated to us that sometimes our leaders lie to us. And both these, both um, what Vietnam and Watergate um, resulted in Americans becoming a lot more cynical about their government. And on some level, this is a good thing. Um, you don't want to be over, you want to be realistic, right? We're like, I mean, politicians are humans. Humans are fallible. Um, some, some are good, some are bad. Most are somewhere in between, um, capable of good or bad. So we need to be realistic about, about it. So it's not necessarily bad that we're a little bit more skeptical about government, but on the other hand, there's a fine, there's a difference between skepticism and hatred. Hatred is where things can get more dangerous. All right, talk about public opinion in the past. Before the 1930s, there were no public opinion polls. So this was frustrating for politicians because if they wanted to know what the public was thinking about an issue, there was really no good way to find out. I mean, you can read the letters that your constituents send you, but those aren't necessarily a good measure. You're only getting the opinions of those who bother to write letters to you, which tends also to be those that care a lot about those issues. So what percentage of Americans do you think contact their elected officials? Maybe 1%. That's whose opinions you're getting if you go solely by that. Before the 1930s, presidents would use newspaper articles and editorials to try to gauge public opinion. This is also flawed <coughs> because, again, you're only getting the opinions of newspaper reporters and editors, which is elite opinion. This may, may or may not reflect the public at large. It's going to reflect, though, people that work for newspapers. Um, so we get... When we look back for the 30s, we tend to get what's called elite opinion. These are the opinions of elites. These are the people that are most active in the political community, most involved. Um, scientific polling didn't begin really until the 1930s. Before that, we had what are called straw polls. Um, we still have those, by the way. Um, they were used beginning in the 19th century to predict the outcome of elections at party meetings and party conventions. Um, if you supported one candidate, you would put a straw painted red into a, ba bu a basket. If you, or if you supported the other candidate, you put a straw painted blue into a basket. Then they would count the straws, and whoever got the most won the straw poll. Of course, this is not a good poll for predicting outcomes of elections because you're only polling people that came out to the party conventions. The first scientific poll came about in 1936. And this was from a guy named George Gallup. 
and there was sort of a dueling polls in that year. 1936 was an election year, and Franklin Roosevelt was up for re-election against Alf Landon. And a liter Literacy Digest poll in 1936 found Landon winning, defeating Franklin Roosevelt. And it had a very large sample size. Um, had, I think, like 50,000 people that were questioned, that were sampled. In other words, who were contacted and asked who they intended to vote for. George Gallup had a much smaller sample size in his poll, only about 5,000. But he correctly predicted that Roosevelt was going to win. So what accounted for this? Why was Gallup right and Literacy Digest wrong? The answer is because Literacy Digest used phone, regist phone books and car registration rolls to contact people they question. Whereas Gallup used a random sample, which means theoretically that everybody who's going to vote's name was put into a hat and then their names were drawn at random. Which one is going to be more likely to represent the public as a whole? Keep in mind, in 1936, most people didn't have cars or telephones. Only those who were tended to be wealthy did. And the wealthy people were more likely to oppose Roosevelt than everyone else. So as you can see, Literacy Digest, by using um, car registration rolls and telephone books, had a sample that was skewed towards the wealthy. Um, Gallup, using a random sample, was more representative of the public at large. And so Gallup was able to correctly predict the outcome of the election. And since then, polls have used generally random samples of voters in, doing, um, in predicting the outcomes of elections. And the Gallup poll, and Gallup still exists today, still a polling firm, um, considered one of the most um, prestigious, still, still, is, still is, exists, and that's historically considered to be the first scientific poll. Now, how is it done? You have a sample. What's a sample? This is a subset of a larger population. So if we're taking a poll of the president's approval rating, then the sample should be all U.S. citizens over the age of 18, if it's the, if it's the president's overall approval rating. If you, want to, if you want to measure his approval rating among women, then your population is going to be female U.S. citizens 18 years of age or older. If you are polling to try to predict the outcome of the presidential race, your sample, or your population rather, should not be all U.S. citizens 18 years of age or older. Rather, it should be U.S. citizens 18 years of age or older who plan to vote. So if you're not registered to vote, then or you don't plan to vote, then you should not be sampled if the pollster is trying to predict the outcome of the election. Um, so... But, regardless of who your population is, you want a representative sample of it. So, if your population is the public at large, you want a sample that looks like the public at large in terms of demographics, um, age, race, gender, income, etc. Um, if your population is women, you want a sample that looks like the population of women. Um, typically, there's various ways to collect data. Typically, polls today are, are um, phone polls. That means that pollsters call people at random and ask them their opinions. Um, but there's other ways to do it, too. Um, online polling has become more, more common, although there's a, if, if, if it's a poll that, say, you're on a news site and you're asked, do you support President Obama or President Trump, click yes or no. That's not really a good scientific poll because your sample is only people that went to that news site's website, which again is not going to be representative of the population as a whole, typically, because most people aren't going to go to that website. All right, three types of polls I want to talk to you about: two that are legitimate and one that is not. 
The first are tracking polls. What's a tracking poll? This is a poll that's taken over and over again every day during an election cycle. And the purpose of doing it every day is that you can gauge over time how the race shifts. So as soon as we determine who the Democratic nominee is going to be for 2020, we're going to, there's going to be start, the polling organizations are going to start polling voters. And every day, these are going to be reported on the news. So candidate X leads candidate Y by three points in the latest tracking poll. This, is a, this represents a change from yesterday when candidate X led by five points. See, the whole horse race thing. The best polls by far for, to, for predicting the outcome of a race, though, are exit polls. And what are exit polls? Pollsters actually go out to voting sites and interview voters immediately after they leave the voting site. These are the best because, A, we know that the people who are being sampled actually voted, and B, they've already voted, so they can't change their mind. Of course, the drawback with this is that you can only do these on election day and during periods of early voting, so they don't really predict much, much into the future. Um, also, but exit polls are what the networks use to project states on election night. You probably know, if you've ever watched election coverage, that usually states are projected. In other words, a candidate is projected to win a state before all the votes come in. Um, exit polls are usually what's used to do this. The last group of polls, and these are actually not polls at all. These No reputable polling organization would conduct one of these. These are push polls. And these are more like a form of smear campaign or negative campaigning than like actual polls. So what push polls attempt to do is spread rumors and innuendo about a candidate. Probably the best way I can explain this is to give you an example. In, 2000, in the 2000 election, um, there was a poll in South Carolina, a reported poll, where pollsters would call um, voters and ask this question. If you found out that John McCain had fathered an illegitimate black child, would you be less likely to vote for him? You think they're really trying to gauge public opinion with that question? Of course not. They're trying to spread rumors. If you listen carefully, they said hypothetically if he did. He didn't, but he did. And let's get real, too. I mean, we're obviously trying to appeal to some racism with this question, too. So that's an example of a push poll. It's a legitimate poll will try will use language as neutral as possible, whereas a push poll will try to push you in a certain direction. All right, talk about error in polls. No poll is 100% reliable. We have what's called a confidence interval, which also known as a margin of error. Um, we take random, use it, the higher the sample size, usually, the smaller the margin of error. If your sample size is 600, typically your, your uh, margin of error is four points. And what does, a, what does margin of error mean? It means you can add that many points or subtract that many points to either candidate's total. So if you have a poll that shows, say, candidate X ahead 47% to 45% with a 4% margin of error, that means actually that the race is effectively a tie because it means that candidate X could be as high as 51% or as low as 43%. And candidate Y, you could add or subtract 4 to that or you can add or subtract three or two to both of them or whatever. So you, if a poll, if the candidate's lead is within the margin of error, that means that the race is effectively a tie. Um, you get error here always. You get, <coughs> for example, things like non-attitudes. If you were to, say, in 2016, call a, call a, uh, likely, a uh, likely voter and say, who do you support for president, Clinton or Trump? And that person has no clue as to who either Clinton or Trump are. They're probably not going to admit to the pollster they don't know because they don't want to be embarrassed and look dumb. So they're just going to name a name. This can affect the, the um, outcome of your polls, affect reliability, but generally not too much because 
In a situation like that, a respondent's equally likely to choose either one of them. If they don't know, they're equally likely to choose Clinton or Trump. So if you have, say, I don't know, 50 people in a sample who have no idea who Clinton and Trump are, roughly 25 of them are going to choose Trump and roughly 25 are going to choose Clinton. May not be exactly that, I mean 26, 24, but you're, the odds of you getting, say, all 50 choose Trump and zero choose Clinton are, is infinitesimally low. So typically, you know, these errors are going to balance each other out. Um, there's also what's called the bandwagon effect. Um, can polls influence the outcome of an election? Theoretically, the answer is yes. The an we know this because if you take a poll the day after election day, whoever won the race is going to get a higher, going to poll higher than they actually perform. So if you took a poll the day after the 2016 election, Trump would have probably gotten 55 or 60 percent in the poll. But we know that's not true because I think in the actual vote he got 46 percent, I believe. So somebody's lying. A lot of people are lying. The reason why, they want to be on the winning side. So we also know that if polls typically, though this is not true 100% of the time, but typically if polls show one candidate ahead on election day, then that candidate's supporters are more likely to go out to the polls and vote. So the answer is it's possible that they can, especially in a very close race. Now, you probably heard a lot of talk about how the polls are, were unreliable in the, uh, recently. And I'm going to show you actual data here. Um, this is, again, the aggregate of all the major polls done by RealClearPolitics.com. You can go look at it yourself. You can look at all these. This is with this is the race with Trump versus Clinton. Johnson and Stein were all included. You can do the two-way one with only Clinton and Trump. You can look at the electoral map. You can look at all this data. You can click on every one of these polls, look at the methodology, um, it's all there. The polls predicted, on average, that Clinton was going to win the popular vote by 3.3%. 3.3 points, I should say. The final results, Clinton won by 2.1 points. So, were the polls accurate? The answer is yes, pretty much. Because look at this, margin of error. Most of them, there's a few exceptions, but most of them, have a margin of error of greater than 1.2 points, which was the difference between the actual result, the actual result, and the predicted result. So they were on the money. What you need to keep in mind is that polls predict popular vote, not the Electoral College. And we don't, as you know, we, choose, we elect the president through the Electoral College, not through the popular vote. Now, 90 percent of the time, whoever wins the popular vote wins the Electoral College. So that's what we were operating on the assumption of, and that's why Clinton was seen as more likely to win. But, turns out 2016 was an exception. It's a time when the Electoral College goes against the popular vote. So the polls were pretty accurate. Now, a couple things. Do polls get things wrong? Sure they do. Absolutely. Um, is that by intention? Well, if it is a reputable polling outfit, like one of these listed here, the answer is they probably don't do it intentionally. And I will tell you why. These organizations make money by conducting polls for campaigns. So if you're running for office, you want your pollster, your polls, to be as accurate as possible. You want to know, for example, if you're behind by two points or behind in the polls because that indicates your campaign strategy is not working and you need to change it. You also want to know which groups you're doing well with and which groups you need to target for campaigning. If a poll shows you losing women by 10 points, you probably want to figure out what issues women care about and emphasize those to try to win them over. If your pollster is telling you, oh, you got this one's in the bag, you're ahead by 10 points, and so you think everything's great, then election day you lose, you're probably going to be pretty mad, right? This would be the equivalent of going to your doctor every, every six months and being told over and over again you're perfectly healthy, and then finding out later you have cancer 
stage four cancer. Too late to do anything about it. If something's wrong, you want to know as early as possible so you when it's easiest to deal with. So the economic incentive is for pollsters to be as accurate as possible. Does that mean they're always accurate? No. And like I said, no poll is 100% accurate. Now, if it's a polling outfit that, say, has never done a poll before, then yes, you should be skeptical. Those could be propaganda. What you need to do is look at the method of you before you before you give a poll credibility, what you need to do is look at who conducted it. Also, look at their methodology. I know most people don't do this, but as with anything, the only way you know the only way you can have an idea if something's credible or not is to actually look at it in detail. If you just look at it at the surface level, then you might think that it's credible or not. Usually, if it confirmation bias, if it supports your views, then it's good, you're going to give it more credibility than if it doesn't. All right, let's talk about public opinion. What drives public opinion? Lots of things. The single biggest factor, though, in what your political views are, are what were your parents' political views. And it's often said that people either adopt the political views of their parents, roughly, or they completely turn against their parents' political views. Either way, regardless of which way you go with that, it's fair to say your parents influenced you either positively or negatively. So usually political attitudes begin to form between the ages of 9 and 13. Now your average 13-year-old doesn't have a full-blown political philosophy. Some do, but most don't. Um, but during that those years, that's when your sense of morality is formed. That's when your sense of um, when you start making assumptions about how things should be and how things should work and develop those ideas. And your politics and your political views are just going to be an extension of that. So how should things work? Well, once you form an idea of that, then it's you just apply that to politics and you get your political views. Um, other things which can affect it are going to be um, parent, your schools, TV and the Internet, college, how much money you make. Um, generational effects can have it too. Major events like a stock market crash in 29 or the... Uh, um, tax of 9-11-2001 can, uh, can sort of shock, cause such a shock that people's views can change radically. Um, there are also more gradual things like views on, like I would be willing to bet that on average, if you're under, well we know this from polling, but if you're under the age of 30, there's a high probability that you support gay marriage. If you're over the age of 60, there's a much lower probability to support gay marriage. I would be willing to bet that those of you listening to this, there's probably several of you who support gay marriage but whose parents don't, but I bet there's very few, if anybody, whose parents support gay marriage, but they don't. So that's an example of like a generational effect. Self-interest, um, you look out for your own interest, which is not selfish at all. I mean, if you're not, if you don't look out for yourself, no one else is going to do it. Um, so things like you want a pothole fixed on the street in front of your house, or you want lower taxes, or you want social security funding increased. These are all examples of self-interest. And again, this is not to say this is bad. Also, elites have an effect, effect too. The, the pundits, the people you see on TV talking, they affect how people view. I mean, a lot of people that are into politics have commentators that they're fans of, and those commentators definitely affect how they view, the, view politics. I'll talk about partisanship and ideology next, and these are two different things, but they are related. Partisanship is what party you identify with. Are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? Um, and once you identify with one of these two political parties, you get what's called a perceptual, perceptual lens, or most people do. This affects how you view the world. Think of it as rose-tinted glasses. The world looks pink when you're wearing rose-tinted glasses. Is it really? No. Um, what I mean by this is go on social media and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. There's all, on Facebook, I see this all the time, all these memes that are getting shared about, about Trump. Either he's the, he's the greatest guy who ever was or he's the worst guy who ever was. 
whether or not you're a Democrat or Republican is definitely going to affect how you view him. And the same was true of Obama before. Sometimes partisanship can subside. Um, a lot of you are too young to remember this, but I'm old, so I remember. On 9-11, all the members of Congress stood on the steps of the Capitol, held hands, and sang, God bless America. Hard to imagine that happening today without some other event like 9-11. Um, also, for about six months after 9-11, there was virtually no partisanship at all. They all, everybody seemed to get along. Of course, came back with a vengeance later on after that. Um, now, some people will say they're independent. That is actually not common. Now, it's common that people will say they're independent, but it's uncommon for them to actually be independent. What do I mean by that? It is pretty unusual, like there's only a small minority of people who are equally likely to vote for a Democrat or Republican. In other words, typically, this is a rough estimate, but typically, going into the, so, so I'll put it this way, going into the 2020 election, there's about 45% of Americans who are probably going to vote for Trump. There's about 45% of Americans who are probably going to vote for whoever the Democratic nominee is. Then there's 10% which could go either way. Those are your independents. Now, if you took a poll, you would find that fewer than 45% identifies Republicans and fewer than 45% identifies Democrats. The answer is because there's roughly, probably only about 30% that strongly identify with Democrats or Republicans. Then there's about 15 more percent that weakly do, but 9 times out of 10 are going to vote. Democrat or Republican anyway. A better question is to ask who you voted for in the last election. If you voted for Trump, you're probably the Republican or at least lean Republican. If you voted for Clinton, you're probably either Democrat or lean Democrat. Yeah, there's some exceptions there, but 90% of the time, 90 plus percent of the time, that's how it works. Ideology, this is similar to partisanship, but not exactly the same. I, the two big ideologies in the United States are liberalism and conservatism. There's a lot more. There's libertarianism, socialism, um, communism, et cetera, et cetera, fascism. And if you take intro to political science, we will talk about all these in a lot more detail. But since this is American government, the two big ones are liberalism and conservatism. And you probably know this already, but Democrats tend to be liberals. Republicans tend to be conservatives. And rough... Very, very um, thumbnail definition of what liberals and conservatives are. Liberals tend to are tend to favor change and tend to favor a stronger role for government and regulation um, to to uh, fight abuse and uh, corruption and things like that to level the playing field. Um, conservatives tend to be more traditional, have a more skeptical view of the role of government. Most Americans, though, aren't really ideologically driven. I can, again, show you this because if I took a poll and said, do you want more funding for education, Social Security, and Medicare? Majority of Americans would say yes. If I took a poll and said, do you think taxes should be lower? Majority of Americans should say yes. Well, you really can't have it both ways. Most Americans would be happy to have it both ways. It'd be great if we could, but <coughs> we can't. So most Americans don't have a ideologically driven view of politics. Is the public informed? Well, here's a quiz to find out if you are. Who is the current Speaker of the House of Representatives? Who are Tennessee's two senators? Um, a lot of Americans couldn't tell you this. Who's the Vice President? Vice President is Mike Pence. The current Speaker of the House is Nancy Pelosi. Tennessee's two Senators are Lamar Alexander and Marsha Blackburn. This is all current as of March 7th, 2019. So if you're listening later, things may have changed. Um, most Americans are not particularly well informed about what's going on. Um, one poll found that only a third of Americans could identify the Senate Majority Leader and only one-fourth knew how many votes are needed to break a filibuster. So, but, there's the whole idea of low information rationality. They may not know all the specifics, but they know the big picture. 
What do I mean by that? Well, they know if the economy is good or not. They know that usually by how their bottom line is affected. If they're doing well financially, you made more money this year than you did last year, you're probably a good chance you're doing well. So this also is a good chance the economy is good. If you're making less, the economy is probably bad. And the economy, as I've said over and over again, is the single most important factor in presidential approval and things like that. Is the public polarized? The answer is yes. What is polarization? This is what happens when the two parties get so far apart that they can barely agree on anything. Or maybe they can't agree on anything. If you look at Congress, 90% of the votes are party line votes. That means the majority of Republicans are on one side and the majority of Democrats are on the other side. Um, if you want to see how polarized we are, try this experiment. Watch an hour of Fox News, then watch an hour of MSNBC. It's like they're reporting on two different countries. Or go on Facebook and see just how vicious people are with each other. The answer is we are very polarized. Now, again, the public is probably less so than politicians and political elites. If you took a random person off the street in Roan County, Tennessee, and a random person off the street in Los Angeles, um, settled next to each other on a, I don't know, say a airplane for a 12-hour flight, chances are they get along fine. They talk to each other and be friendly with each other. Because, but, yeah, politically we are very, very polarized. All right, so group differences. When you talk about different demographics here and how that can affect public opinion, your background, your age, your social class, your income, your religion, your sex, your race, and your geography. So what your background? If you've experienced a, been a victim of a crime, then you may favor a more tough-on-crime approach. If you came from a traditional family, traditional mom and pop, two kids, go to church on Sundays, have a dog, family, you're probably going to view that as best. If you came from a non-traditional family, you're probably not necessarily going to view the traditional family as best. Your age, the younger you are, the less likely you are to vote. Which is a shame because it's your country too. Think about this. We hear a lot about student loan crisis. Students are graduate or people are graduating from college more in debt than ever. By the way, you all are smart because you're hopefully taking advantage of Tennessee Promise or Tennessee Reconnect and avoiding this debt. Hopefully you'll continue to do that. Or if you're not, I mean tuition at Roan State, I mean I'll agree it's it's high, but it's a whole lot lower than anywhere else. Um, so y'all are smart in avoiding this, to, to some extent at least. But I will say this, if that crisis was affecting, say, senior citizens, it probably would have been dealt with. You can't, Social Security and Medicare are always, always, always major campaign issues because old people vote in big numbers. That's why. If young people voted in the same numbers as old people, then issues that matter to young people would be more would be taken more seriously and dealt with by politicians because they would have to. So you want to you want politicians to care more about you? Get out and vote. Um, social class, yeah, we see a lot of the elite versus the common folk. This is a common theme in American politics going way back, at least Andrew Jackson. We see it very much today too. Um, social or income, religion, you can oftentimes tell how someone's going to vote based on their religion. If they, if they go to church every Sunday, if they go to a Baptist church every Sunday, probably they vote Republican. If they are, um, non-religious, they're more likely to vote Democratic. Um, gender, women are more likely to vote Democratic, not overwhelmingly, but slightly more likely to vote Democratic. Race, most minorities are more likely to be Democrats. African Americans overwhelmingly vote Democratic. Hispanics substantially vote Democratic. Asian Americans in the last election voted more Democratic than Republican, although they're, they're closer. And geography. If you live in a rural area, you probably vote Republican. If you live in an urban area, you probably vote Democratic. If you live in the suburbs, you're kind of a swing vote. And to demonstrate this, oh, I didn't... There it is. Okay. Actually, we'll get to this in a minute. 
Okay, well, actually, we've already talked about this. There's been a shifting view, too, on religion, sex, and ethnic factors. We're more accepting today of minority leaders. We see this. We elected the first African-American president, of course. Um, we also have more women in Congress than ever before. Protestants tend to lean right. Catholics tend to be a swing vote. Jews tend to vote Democratic. Um, if you look, which is no surprise, Catholics are a swing vote. If you look at the states that are swing states, places like Florida or Ohio or Pennsylvania or Michigan, these tend to be places where there is a large population of Catholics. So one of the reasons they're swing states. Geographic influence, too. If you pull a random person off the street in Rockwood, Tennessee, and a random person off the street in San Francisco, are they likely to agree on politics? It's possible they would, but I would bet not. I'd say there's a 90% chance they won't. Um, and that just reflects the urban-rural divide. Actually, if you pull a random person off the street in Market Square in Knoxville and a random person off the street in Rockwood, good chance they're not going to agree either. Again, that's the urban-rural divide. Here's the election results from 2016 county by county. The red counties are ones that Trump carried. The blue counties are ones that, that Clinton carried. Looks like Trump won in a landslide. He didn't really, but it looks that way because he won nearly all of the rural counties, whereas Clinton won nearly all the urban ones, like Nevada. Looks like Trump won Nevada overwhelmingly, right? Actually, Clinton won Nevada, but even although she only carried two counties. Well, what's here? Las Vegas. Population of Las Vegas is, I don't know off the top of my head, but substantially more, maybe, Half the population of Nevada, I'm not sure. <coughs> or Illinois. Again, looks like Trump won Illinois big. Actually, Clinton won Illinois, but look up here. This is Chicago, where a lot of people live. Or New York, same thing. New York City, this area, um, Clinton won that. Or Tennessee, you can see what counties did Clinton carry in Tennessee. Well, that's Memphis right there. And that's Nashville. That's Shelby County. That's Davidson County. And this county here, I'm not sure what county that is, but it's probably a suburb of, of uh, Memphis. So that explains it. So rural-urban divide is a big thing. Group influence matters too. Nobody wants, or not many people like conflict. Are you hesitant to post things about politics on Facebook? You might be because I see this every day. Somebody posts in a opinion on Facebook, even if they do so respectfully and and uh, moderately, some some jerk responds with some personal insult. Happens every day. First rule of politics, first rule of uh, Facebook, don't read the comments. So there's a lot of people who are hesitant to speak publicly because of stuff like this. Um, your friends, associates, peers, authority of figures can influence opinion. Why does this happen? Well, you ever heard of the Milgram experiments? There was a guy named Stanley Milgram. He was a psychologist at Yale. And he was interested in, in obedience to authority. Specifically, he was interested in Nazi war criminals. You know, the people that actually carried out the mass killings in Nazi Germany. When they were put on trial after the war at Nuremberg, they... they um, their legal defense was I was only following orders. I didn't want to do this, but my commanding officer, my boss, ordered me to do it. And so I had no alternative. It was determined that's not a valid legal defense. If your authority, if a your commander orders you to do something illegal, then legally you're you have to disobey. But Milgram was more interested not from the legal perspective, but from the psychological perspective. Does that explain it? Would the average person have carried out crimes like this if an authority figure had ordered them to do it. And so he devised a experiment to try to figure this out. And here's what he did. He took volunteers at, in New Haven, which is the, in Connecticut, and divided them up into pairs. One person in the pair was the teacher. The other person in the pair was the student. They were put on opposite sides of a wall. They could talk to each other through the wall, but they couldn't see each other. The student was put into a device to receive an electrical shock. The teacher was given a button, which they could push to administer an electrical shock to the student. 
Each time the button is pushed, the voltage increases. The teacher is given a series of questions to ask the student. Each time the student gets a question wrong, the teacher is instructed to push the button and shock the student. Um, Milgram, or one of his associates, wears a lab coat like a doctor, because, you know, doctors are authority figures and respected in society, and stands over the teacher's shoulder and administers the experiment. If the teacher questions the experiment the first time, <coughs> Milgram's response is, please continue. Second time they question it, the response is, it is imperative that you continue. Third time they question it, the response is, you have no other alternative, you must continue. At fourth time they question it, the experiment is called off. And he's not standing there with a gun to the teacher's head. The teacher can get up and walk out at any time, refuse to do it. Now, the student is not actually receiving a shock. They are in on the experiment. They are acting. But the teacher believes they're actually shocking the student. And the student responds each time the button is pushed. Ouch at first, because it's a little, just a little bit of pain. Up to, they're screaming in agony. And then eventually they yell something like, oh God, my heart, and then silence. So presumably, the teacher has killed the student. The experiment is to see who would administer the lethal amount of voltage. And the findings are not exactly comforting. Findings are 65%, two-thirds, two out of three, in other words, actually killed the student, which suggests that humans are much more obedient to authority than we like to believe. Probably not the results he was looking for. This experiment has been done many times over the years since then, almost always has come up with similar results. So the answer is, yeah, probably the average person would commit atrocities, and it wouldn't even take that much to get them to do it. So group influence and authority influence is very powerful, much more powerful than we like to think. Um, talked about reference groups, what influence politics, one are primary groups, one are secondary groups. Primary groups are people you interact with, your parents, your friends, your colleagues, etc., Secondary groups are people you don't know personally but may influence you, people like religious leaders that you don't talk to on a daily basis or pundits or commentators, celebrities perhaps, etc. You may know what this, who these people are. I include this because this is an infamous picture. We're about to talk about, some vi about violence. This is Rosalind Carter, the first lady of the United States, wife of Jimmy Carter. She is, at the time this picture is taken, the First Lady of the United States. This is John Wayne Gacy, a serial killer who had the bodies of, I think, about 34 boys and young men buried in the crawl space under his house. At the time this picture was taken, there were bodies buried under his house. Here he is shaking hands with the First Lady of the United States. That's scary, right? This turned out this was a big embarrassment for the Secret Service, as you can imagine, but Gacy hadn't been caught when this happened, so... He would have come up clean on a background check. Violence in politics, thankfully in the United States, this has been generally rare, although we have seen some. Last election, there was somebody sending bombs through the mail to, to uh, politicians and political figures. Um, 1981, Reagan was shot. March 30th, 1981, the day I was brought home from the hospital. <coughs> I was bad luck, I guess, or maybe good luck. He survived. Um, he was shot by John Hinckley, who was trying to impress Jodie Foster, the actress. Not making that up. If you ever see the movie Taxi Cab, um, Hinckley had seen that. Foster in that movie played a 14-year-old child prostitute. And Robert De Niro played a taxi driver who wanted to assassinate a U.S. senator, but got caught before he could do it. So instead, he ran and shot up the brothel where... Jodie Foster's character was being held, so like the whole thing, uh, shooting Reagan was life imitating art. Um, the LA riots, the Weather Underground. Um, this was a revolutionary um, leftist um, terrorist group in the '60s and '70s. There's been some anti-abortion violence. Some um, abortion clinics have been bombed or targeted. Generally, though, violence has been rare, and that is something we should be thankful for. Hopefully. It will continue to be rare because certainly it is not. It is more common in other countries and mostly places you don't want to be. All right, that's all for today. I will see you back here next time. Have a good day.